Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus, one of the most important theorems. I'm not going to go through the proof because the proof is available in the textbook, but basically it uses the idea of uh, the derivative, uh, the original derivative that we had limit f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So what is the theorem? I'm going to mention the theorem and see how we use this theorem. Okay, so this is the main theorem. It's broken down into two pieces. So for, let's go through part one first. Let's say given a function f uh, with the assumption that f is a continuous function over an interval a to b. So if you have a continuous function over an interval a to b, then the integral from a to x, x is a variable at this moment. It could be a constant, but uh, for this case at the moment it's a variable. A is a fixed value, x is a, con x is a variable of the function f of t dt is called the g of x function. So the outcome of this function depends on the upper bound of the integral x. So it would be a function of x. And this is over the interval a to b. Okay, what is the property of g? The property of g is that if you take a derivative of g, you'll get the simple function of f. So if you have a function f, and if you're looking for the integral from a to x of f that is basically a g function where the derivative of g is simply a function f and uh, the function g turns out to be continuous and differentiable and its derivatives are possible everywhere and it is a continuous function first see what is the purpose for this fundamental theorem of calculus last time we talked about indefinite integral sorry definite integral means if I would have asked you, let's call this an example. If I would have asked you to calculate the integral from one to three of the function f of t dt or f of x dx, let me stick with x for the moment. If I asked you to calculate this, what does it mean? It means area under the function f under f over the interval, over this interval, from 1 to 3. Means from 1 to 3, if x varies from 1 to 3, find out the area under this function. And we mentioned that if the function is positive, you assume the area is positive. If it's below the x-axis, then we assume it's negative. So we want to approximate this area. But when they mention the in definite integral, you're lo looking. You're not looking for approximation. You want to find the exact value. So we want to find the exact value. And this is nothing but a triangle. So this is height two, length two, two times two divided by two would be simply two. So I can say this area is simply two. One half length times height. So this is one half times two times two. And if I ask you similarly from three to five, f of x dx. The integral would be area under the function in that section. So it would be this square, 2 times 2. The area would be 4. The integral from 5 to 6 of f of x dx would be this triangle. Length 1, height 2. Area would be 1. And from 6 to 8 of f of x dx, this part. It would be uh, 6 to 8 would be 2 and height here is 1. It would be negative 1 since we're below the x-axis. The area would be 1 but since the graph is below the x-axis, the function is below the x-axis, we assume it's negative. This was the definite integral. So how is it related to this uh, g function? Let's think about this. Let's ignore every part of this, only f let's focus on only this triangle. If I would, instead of saying from one to three, if I would have asked you from one to two, what is the area of the function? That means find out where two is, there's two, and find the area of this small triangle. It turns out by picking two, this height would be one, 
This is length one, so one times one divided by two, you would get one half. Okay, what if I change this length to instead of picking two, what if I say I want it at 2.7? You have to figure out what is that height and length times height and divide by two. So if this is 2.7, this height becomes, since this is like a, let me draw the triangle out here. Here's one. Here's two and it's three. Okay, so at 2.5, for example, this height would be correspond to 1.5. If you move 1.5 to the right, you have to go up 1.5 since this is a 45-degree uh, angle line. Okay, so this triangle would have height 1.5 and length 1.5, equal length and height. So what do you get is integral from 1 to uh, 2.5 of f of x dx turns out to be 1.5 times 1.5 times 1 half. So 1.5 squared times 1 half, whatever that is. Okay, so now the question becomes, what if instead of ask, giving you this and say, calculate from 1 to x of f of t dt by the way this t i don't want to write x because then they these upper bound and the variable will depend on each other so we use a t for the uh, value it's, it has the same meaning it says if you're given this triangle starting from one if you stop at x the same triangle where x is between three and two where x is somewhere between one and three then what is this area and we notice that this length would be x minus one that length would be x minus one as well remember 2.5 minus one was 1.5 so what do you get is x minus one squared that is what we get Times, this is a triangle, you should multiply a one half to it. Length times width times the height. Correct? This is the area under that triangle. If you check it for three, you get three minus one, which is two. Two squared is four, times one half would be two. So this gives you the area from one to three. It will give you this whole triangle. Okay, so now I can answer this question. Let's say if I've given the integral of f of t dt from 1 to x. I will get a function. Here I found a function because the uh, upper bound is variable. So the area must be a variable. This is the area. So let's call this g function. So I found the g function is 1 half x minus 1 squared. It's not required to find it at the moment. I'm just going to try to explain what is the fundamental theorem of calculus saying. Now... If I find out what is the derivative of g, so we found that g function. What is the derivative of g? Drag down the exponent, subtract one from the exponent, you get one half times two times x minus one, multiply by the derivative of inside, which is simply one. And if you simplify it, these two will cancel out, so you get simply x minus one. So now, here is the derivative. What is that derivative? It turns out this derivative, this x minus 1, is exactly the equation for this line. Which is what's as f function. So this is the same as f function. That is what this whole fundamental theorem of calculus, the first part is. It says, if you find the function for the area, that derivative of that function is simply the, fun the function that creates the curve. This is the f function. And if you do it for the other piece, you'll get the same thing. If you do it for this one, you'll get the same property. All these, you calculate the function. As an example, you should go through it, try to calculate a function. For example, find out what is the integral from 3 to x of f of t dt. Find that. That would be a g function. And that gives you the area in this part from 3 to x somewhere here. 
And then if you take the derivative of that, you should get this constant function of two because the f function is constant at that point. Okay, so this is the fundamental term of calculus. How do we use it? Here's an example of it. Find the derivative of the function gx is given as one to x of square root of uh, one plus t squared dt. Okay. If you look at the fundamental term of calculus and compare it, what you have is gx equals this is the fundamental term of calculus a to x f of t dt. So what is f of t? You can say f of t is simply square root of one plus t squared. A comparison two must be the same. And a is just a constant. In this case, a is one. So what do they want? Find the derivative. So we want to find out what is g prime x. Remember this. You, the fundamental term of calculus would say the derivative of g is simply the function f. So what is the function f? Square root of 1 plus x squared. That's it. You shouldn't use t here. You should use x. The f, f function is originally represented here by t, but you have to replace it with x. So the derivative of g is simply this function inside. This is in case if the power upper bound is x. But what if the upper bound was not x, if it was x to the power of four? Here is where it gets a bit tricky. It's not too complicated, but it's gonna be a bit tricky and you should be careful. Okay. If they would have asked you to calculate d to the derivative of, okay, so this means find the derivative of this integral. Okay, so this is the same as if you call it the g function, they want to find out what is the derivative of d to dx of g. This is the same question. Okay, what if we change this x to the power 4 to a new variable? Instead of x to the power 4, what if it was called the u? 1 to the power 1 to u secant e dt. And they ask you to find the d over d u first. Now let's do a dx, why not? Okay, if this was the case, what you would say is, I'll find the derivative of that by saying, okay, this is the derivative of d over dx of g of u, not g of x, because now the variable is u. And how do we find the derivative of g of u? It would be g prime, the derivative of the outside function, multiplied by the derivative of the inside, u prime, or you can write it as du over dx by chain rule. So what I'm implementing is basically chain rule. What is the derivative of g prime u? Remember by the fundamental term of calculus, the derivative of g prime is simply that function, f. So it would be secant of u, but what is u? u is x to the power of four. Multiply by derivative of u with respect to x. What is the derivative of u with respect to x? It is the derivative of u, which is x to the power of 4. So we need to figure out what is the derivative of x to the power with respect to x. So it is secant x to the 4 times 4x cubed. This is basically the idea of taking the derivative. There are shortcuts. What is the derivative of d to the x of secant x? Replace this x to the 4 into it, then take the derivative of that, multiply by it. That's the, basically the shortcut. But if you go through the step by step, this is the idea. You're using chain rule. Okay. If you had two boundaries, by the way, if you had from x to x squared of, let's say, secant e dt, and they ask you to find the derivative over dx sorry if they would have asked you to find that then simply think about it as this way if i had it because now both upper bound and lower bound are variables if i had from zero to x squared let me ignore the derivative for the moment i need to see
Maybe let me rearrange this so it's easier to see. X to zero, zero to X squared. This is by the property that we learned from the definite integrals. We add these two, the middle point will disappear and you'll get one integral from X to X squared. And then by the other property that we learned that if you interchange the boundaries, if I change the X and zero, and write it like that, I have to multiply a negative. So now the question is, how do I find the derivative? D over dx. And we just learned. Let me make this x to the power, yeah, x to the power of 2 is good enough. And we just learned that the derivative of this first one is simply the negative sign is still there. Secant x, since the boundary is x, you don't need chain rule. But for the second one, plus the derivative of secant at x squared, not the derivative, multiply by x squared derivative in general. And the derivative of x squared is simply 2x. So if you have upper bound and lower bound, simply you can say the derivative evaluated at upper bound minus the derivative at lower bound. That's the same thing as splitting it into two pieces. Okay. Most of the uh, examples are using this idea. If the upper bounds are constant, you ignore them. Or lower bounds are constant, you ignore them. If it's not in this format, you rearrange the order. If you have both variables, try to split them up. Okay, now here is the second part of the fundamental term of calculus. This didn't really help with calculating definite integral. The second part of the uh, theorem is to calculate that integral. And it says, if you have the integral from a to b, if you have from a to b of f of x, this definite integral is basically the capital F at the upper bound minus the capital F at lower bound. What is capital F? Capital F is the antiderivative of F because the derivative of the capital function is simply F. So capital F is the antiderivative of F. And remember there were constants added to the antiderivative. It, at this point, uh, the fundamental term of calculus says it doesn't really matter what that constant is. And pick that constant to be zero. That's why they say any antiderivative of f. If you pick another con, if you pick a different constant than zero, then it doesn't make any difference. The subtraction between the two functions, the subtraction will cancel out that constant. So let me show you how to evaluate. For example, evaluate from negative one to one x squared dx. Okay, so what does this integral basically says it says if you have this from negative one to one negative one to one this area and this area what is the area uh, sum of these two this is the function f which is x squared what is the sum of these two parts from negative one that's basically what the question is asking but we don't really know since it's a curve but the fundamental term of calculus, the second part says, find the antiderivative of f first. So what is f? f of x is x squared. What is the antiderivative of x squared? What is the capital F function? This is what we learned from 3.9. Derivative of what function is x squared? Remember, you add 1 to the exponent, divide by the same thing, so you will get 1 third x to the power of 3, plus any constant. It says you can let this constant to be whatever you want. You can let it to be zero. You can let it to be any constant. I'm going to pick C for the moment so you would see why is that irrelevant, this constant. So then it says evaluate the function at the upper bound minus the function at the lower bound. So the capital F function, F at 1 minus F at negative 1. So let's first find out what is f of 1. f of 1 would be replace 1 into the function. 1 third, 1 to the power 3 plus c. f at the negative 1 would be 1 third, negative 1 to the power 3 plus c. And if you simplify, this is 1 third plus c. This one is negative 1. 
third plus c. Okay, now what do we get if we do this calculation? We get one third plus c. This is the f of one minus f of negative one minus one third plus c. You see, here is the important part c minus c. They cancel out. It doesn't really matter what you picked for that constant. That's why it didn't really matter. You could have picked 10, 100, they always cancel out. So for simplicity, from this point on, we pick this C to be zero. If they ask you to find the antiderivative, you should consider that C. But if you're calculating the uh, definite integral with upper and lower bound, then that C really doesn't matter because it always cancel out since you subtract. And one third minus minus one third is simply two thirds. So what we found is that this area is one third, this area is one third. Add them together, you'll get two thirds. That is the area. Okay, so we answer this question precisely and then say the area is two thirds. Here's another one. Find the area under the curve f of x equals to two x from zero to b, where uh, b is between zero and three. Actually, before I do this, let me show you in notation. So let me shift this down a bit. So at this point on, let me calculate the same integral. At this point on, if you want to evaluate an integral from negative 1 to 1 x squared, let me change it to a different one. x to the power 3, for example, dx. And the simple x, why are we going too far? Okay. What do you say is this is the small f? Okay, since we already found the small and large for x squared, let me stick with this example. First, you find the capital F function. We found one third x cubed. So I'm going to write the capital F function one third x cubed. And you don't really need this constant c because it always disappears. So I say the integral from negative one to one of x squared dx is one third x cubed. But what do I need to do? I need to evaluate, so this vertical line is evaluate from where to where, from negative one to one. And it means place one into the function, one third, one to the power three, minus, then replace negative one, one third, negative one to the power three. So if you did see these notations, and if you simplify, you'll get one third minus minus one third, it'll give you two thirds. So if you see this notation of the capital F function evaluated at the lower and upper bound, basically means replace B into the F, subtract it from uh, F of A. And basically that's what we did. We found F of B minus F of A. So I'm going to stick with this format. I'm not going to find F separately. So this is the capital F function. This is a small f. You notice from this line to the next line, there is no integral. This integral disappeared because we already found the antiderivative. The antiderivative is simply this one third x cubed. So this notation of uh, vertical line is very uh, useful. We're going to use this often. Here, find the area under the curve f of x equals to 2x from 0 to b, where b is somewhere between zero and three. Yeah, let me change this to one to B and one to three. Okay, so what do we get? We're gonna find the area under the curve from one to B. For what function? For two X, dx. What do we get? Actually, we did one already in the other example, so let's stick with zero because zero has a good property at this moment. You can draw it and it's easier to see from zero. Sorry. Okay. First, find the antiderivative. What is the antiderivative of 2x? Keep the 2, multiply. What is the antiderivative of x? You add 1 to the exponent, divide by the same thing, or yeah, x to the power 2. By by two. This is the antiderivative function. This is the capital F, and then evaluate from zero to b. 
I can simplify it first. So get x squared from zero to b. X squared, if you replace b into it, you'll get b squared minus, if you replace zero, zero squared. We get b squared. Means if you draw this line, zero to three, the function given two x, at three you'll have six. And if I ask you for any b that you pick, for any b you pick in this interval, if you look at this triangle, and I ask you what is the area of that triangle, the answer is simply b squared. That's it. This is what this formula calculates from 0 to b of 2x dx. You can test it by looking at the biggest integral, biggest uh, triangle. That means if I let b equals 3, what do you expect? This height is 6, this length is 3. So what do you expect from the area? Area must be 6 times 3 divided by 2. It would be 9. What is b? b is supposed to be 3. So replace 3 here. What do you get? 3 squared simply 9. You can try with another number. If I pick 2, this height is going to be 4. So what is the area? Then it would be 4 times 2 divided by 1 half. It would be 4. If I pick b to be 2, I'll get 4 as the area. Any other number, as long as you pick the number in, in the, between 0 to 3. Actually, if you go beyond that, then you've already exceeded this. It still works. You go 5 or whatever. The triangle becomes larger. 5 squared at the end, you will get 25. Yeah. So this is what this definite uh, integral will calculate. Oh, this is important too. Here, they ask you what is wrong with this integral. Because if we calculate, if we go through what we've learned, so let's look at what we have learned from negative one to one, one over x squared dx. If you want to find the antiderivative, first you have to write it as x to the power negative two instead of one over x squared, and then take the antiderivative. How do we take the antiderivative? You add one to the exponent, divide by the same exponent, then from negative one to one. Simplify this function, simplify this. This is the capital F function, by the way. The simplified form is negative 1 divided by x, then evaluated from negative 1 to 1. If you replace 1 into it, what you get is negative 1 divided by 1. If you replace negative 1 into it, you get negative 1 divided by negative 1. So what is wrong with this? Because now, I see that I got negative 2. It doesn't seem like negative 2 matches up with negative 4 there. By the way, did I make any mistake? Even if this was negative 2, maybe I wrote it wrong originally. Maybe I wrote it wrong here. Okay, so now let's say even if it was negative 2. Something is wrong with this integral. Let's think about this. What does 1 over x squared look like? 1 over x squared kind of looks like this. Is it a different color? 1 over x squared, how the graph of the function. And what are you trying to calculate is from negative 1 to 1. This area. And that area. What do you notice first is the area must be positive because it's above the x-axis, but what you've got is simply a negative number, so something is wrong. What is wrong is that you do not have a continuous function. All the assumptions that we made talk about the derivatives and the antiderivatives uh, for the fundamental theorem of calculus is that the function is supposed to be continuous. But 1 over x squared is discontinuous at 0. At 0, this function is undefined. So if you have an, a discontinuous function, discontinuous function, then you cannot use this fundamental theorem of calculus such, in such a way. So 
So the problem with this is one over x squared is discontinuous on the interval negative one to one. In this interval, at negative one to one is discontinuous. If I would have picked one to three, that would have been fine. But since in this area function is discontinuous, then there is no uh, there is no way to use this fundamental term of calculus. Actually, there is a way, but you have to split it into two parts from zero, uh, negative one to zero, then zero to one. But that causes another issue. Okay, so uh, at this moment, we only consider the continuous function to use the fundamental term of calculus. And here's one more example. They ask you to find an integral from negative one to four of f of x dx. You have a piecewise function. What do we do? We want to find out what is the integral from negative one to four f of x dx. Let me draw the picture. Makes it easier to understand. So here, if x is greater than zero, square root of x. You have square root of x. And if x is less than zero, x squared. What we have is two continuous functions. This is continuous at zero. So I can use fundamental term of calculus from negative one to four. I ask what is this area plus this area? That's the question. But here, what you notice is you have two different functions. So I cannot find an, one antiderivative. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break it at this point. Point where you change the function, x changes at zero. You go from x squared to square root of x. So I'm going to break the integral and say I'm going to evaluate from negative to zero. Then I'll evaluate from zero to four. Negative one to zero of what? From negative one to zero, what is the function? It is x squared. Then I will add it from zero to four to the square root of x. Means I will find that area, add it to the other area. And simply now, I will do each one separately. So here, from negative one to one x squared dx is, uh, the antiderivative of x squared is one third x cubed or x cubed over three. Evaluate from negative one to one. We already did this earlier. We get, we do this again, one third times one to the power of three minus one third times negative one to the power of three. Make sure you use bracket to show that this negative should be distributed. At this moment, there's only one term here, negative one third. And here, this is a one third. So you have one third minus minus one third of the Give us two thirds. This is the first area. This piece has two thirds as it. Oh, sorry, this was not from eighty one to zero. That's what that was my mistake. This is zero. Okay. That didn't make sense. There we go. This area is one third. Because the upper bound was supposed to be zero. And the other integral is from zero to four square root of x, which is x to the power one half dx. And simply first find the antiderivative, add one to the exponent, divide by the same exponent. You don't need to add the constant c, evaluate from zero to four. Always simplify first. You can multiply it two third on the top and bottom. Two thirds. This will cancel out. So what you get is two third x to the power three half, which is square root of x cubed, evaluate from zero to four. You replace two third. If you replace four in there, you get four cubed, square root of that, minus, if you replace zero, you'll get two third square root of zero cubed. This is simply zero. This one is eight times two divided by three, 16 over three. So you have 16 over three. This is the other area, 16 over three. So what is this total? 
is one third plus 16 over 3. 17 over 3. If you have two pieces of functions, try to break it uh, where the function changes. This is maybe the most complicated one because you have to deal with separate functions. Okay, so two things that we learn from this uh, fundamental theorem of calculus is one we can calculate the definite integrals if we find the antiderivative function, and the other one is the derivative of the integral if the upper bound or lower bound, one of those two is a variable, is basically this function inside. If the variable is uh, complicated like x to the power of 4, then you have to consider the chain rule for the derivative. This is what we did secant. Uh, we did the derivative x to the power of 4 multiplied for x cubed. Okay, this is where I'm going to stop. Next time we will discuss what if you don't have an upper bound or lower bound. That's called the indefinite integral. Uh, uh, that basically calculates only the antiderivative function. Okay, I'm going to stop at this point. We'll continue next.